Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to Eliminating Switch Bounce with a Debounce Circuit. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this video, so let's get started. So what is Switch Bounce? Well, Switch Bounce happens in mechanical switches, and this could be a mechanical switch or a push button that you do by hand, or it could be an automated or electrically controlled switch like an armature relay. But the whole idea is, is when you close the switch, for a brief moment, it makes contact, but it vibrates or bounces off the other contact, which causes the electrical connection to open and close, open and close until it finally settles in the closed position. So that is what I'm showing below in the picture here. So imagine we have, we have time versus amplitude. So time on the x-axis, amplitude on the y-axis. And let's say we're monitoring a switch or a digital pin here and the digital pin is pulled to ground, it's low, and then when the switch closes, the switch connects it to VCC, which pulls it high. So here we are with the switch open, we have a ground condition, then we close the switch, and here's where we get the switch bounce. So the switch initially closes, which causes the voltage at the switch, or at that pin, to go high, but when the switch bounces, or the contacts bounce, we get this high and low condition, and then finally it settles in a high condition. Switch bounce may or may not be an issue in your circuit or design depending on how you're using it. So a great example is when switch bounce doesn't matter is if you're familiar with Arduino, you know, the Arduino boards have a relay button on them. So when you press that relay button, and that relay button is actually used to uh, I should mention, used to reset the Arduino. And it actually works in a reverse manner to what we're seeing here. So the reset switch or reset pin on Arduino is normally high, and then when we push the button down, it pulls it to ground. But I guarantee you, since that's a mechanical switch, when you first push it to ground, you get a little bouncing low to high before you finally settle on low. Now in that case, the switch bounce doesn't matter. Why? Because the reset pin just needs to feel one low condition and it resets. It doesn't matter if it bounces up and down. But let's say you're dealing with an interrupt. So if, and if you're not familiar with interrupts, I have an interrupt video on my, on my YouTube channel, but an interrupt basically detects an event on a pin, an asynchronous event, and it basically triggers you know, a certain portion of the code. And so interrupts can be triggered multiple ways, but one way is using a rising edge or falling edge of a you know, high to low transition. So that's when switch bounce can be an issue. So if you have an interrupt that triggers off a rising edge like this one, you're gonna trigger that interrupt, but guess what? You're gonna trigger it again and again and again until you finally stay high. And most of the time, you're just looking to trigger that interrupt once, not multiple times. So that's, that's the main issue with switch bounce. The good news is, is there's a lot of ways to deal with switch bounce. You can use a debounce circuit. So when you talk about switch bounce, you talk about, and you want to get rid of it, you talk about debouncing it. So you can do a debounce circuit, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video, and we're going to show an example. Actually, here's the circuit I'm going to use, but I'm going to talk about that more later. You could do the debouncing in software, and this typically involves detecting, you know, the rising or falling edge, and then using, you know, timer counters inside the microcontroller to basically shut off the interrupt or wait a certain period of time for the debouncing to stop and then continue with the interrupt. So this is one path you can go. I'm not going to talk about this in this video beyond this mentioning it. Then you can also get debounce ICs. So here are some from Maxim and here are the model numbers and you can go to their data sheet and you can see how to set them up. I'm not, personally I'm not a big fan of the ICs because they're typically like two or three dollars each which to me is high versus this simple circuit with components that you know are, are essentially a penny. Okay, so there's three ways to deal with it. We're just gonna talk about the debounce circuit. Next, we're gonna look at a real life condition where you get switch bounce. We'll show the debounce circuit and we'll show how the debounce circuit eliminates the switch bounce. So let's show an example with an anemometer. So an anemometer is a device shown here that measures wind speed. 
So these cups capture the wind, the wind spins it around. Inside this anemometer is a relay. And when normally the relay is open and when this when these things make one revolution, they close the relay momentarily and then it opens back up. So if you measure the distance between one edge of the relay closing to the next, you can calculate wind speed. So you typically, you know, if you didn't know about switch bounce, you could set up a circuit like this. So you connect one end or one pin of the anemometer to, to uh, five volts or 3.3 volts. You then use a resistor to ground. So when this is open, here's our digital interrupt pin, we'll read a ground condition here. And then when the relay closes, the anemometer spins around, we, we detect a high here. So we'll see this pulse motion. So here's an oscilloscope output capturing the anemometer spinning with the circuit I just showed you. So we can see that when we're low, you know, the, the relay inside the anemometer is not closed. When we go high, it closes momentarily, then it goes back to low. And you can actually, if you look across here, you can see that these pulses are spaced at different lengths. And that's showing that, and actually what we can see here is the wind is actually slowing down because they're closer together here. So we can use that to measure the wind speed. Now I'm using an anemometer just as an example. This could easily be you know, someone pressing a button real quick to close it. Now, from first glance, and once again, we have time on the x-axis, amplitude on the y-axis, it looks like we're fine. We, we don't see any switch bounce. We can trigger off an interrupt off the rising or falling edges without any issues. But if we zoom in closer, we can actually see that there is switch bounce. So here we can see switch bounce. The, the anemometer has a read relay in here. A read relay is a small relay and it has contacts that almost look like a canoe paddle, real small metal canoe paddle. And read relays actually typically don't have too much switch bounce, but we can see there is some. Once again, we're looking at one of those pulses you just seen, the rising edge, but we're zoomed in much closer in time. You can see the switch bounce is very quick. It, you know, one of these squares or rectangles is 20 microseconds. So we can see that the debounce only happens for you know, so many microseconds before it stops. But this is enough if we're using these edges and interrupts to time the anemometer wind speed, we're gonna get a false reading here because we're gonna have an interrupt occur here and then we could have it occur again. Once again, the interrupt has to rearm but it could easily rearm again by here and we'll get a false reading. It'll look like the wind is either, it'll look like the wind is really fast, much faster than it really is. So let, let's see how we can deal with this switch bounce. Okay, here is our debounce circuit. I showed it earlier. And I'm gonna step through how this circuit works. So what do we have here? We have some resistors, we have a diode, and we have a capacitor. So I th I'm guessing most people have a basic understanding of how these components work. But I'll, I'll talk about them here too as well. So let's walk through how this works. So here's the interrupt pin of our you know, microcontroller connected right here to this node. Here's our switch, which could be once again a push button or it could be the anemometer that I just showed. So we have VCC coming in here. So when the switch is open, VCC is not connected to the circuit so the circuit is essentially gonna be at a ground level everywhere around here. So we have ground here. So at our interrupt pin, we're gonna be at a low condition. Once the switch closes, we get a high on the anode of the diode and we have a low here. So we're immediately gonna turn the diode on and the diode essentially acts like a closed switch. Now there will be some, you know, some small voltage dropped across it, but we can have current flowing from one end of the diode to the other. And so when the switch closes, and once again, this is happening real quick, the switch closes, the diode turns on, current can flow, and current starts charging up the capacitor. Now, how much, how long does it take the capacitor to charge depends on the capacitor value, and we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna show an example where we use one microfarad and 100 microfarad. But as this capacitor charges, the voltage level of this interrupt pin begins to rise till eventually we get to a high level and it triggers the interrupt.
if this switch was ideal, we would just close it, the, the capacitor would quickly charge, the voltage would get high, and we have our interrupt condition. But because of switch bounce, we're going to close the switch, it's going to start charging the capacitor. Now, and in some kind of random way, the switch will bounce a couple times. So we'll lose contact, we'll get it back, we'll lose it, we'll get it back, and then finally it will settle. Well, this is where the capacitor comes in. And a capacitor, you can think of it as a battery that charges really fast and discharges really fast. And the value of the capacitor controls how much it charges, and the value of these resistors controls how fast it discharges. So when, we're, when we start to charge up, let's say we get a bounce and our switch loses contact, the pin won't immediately go to zero, won't go to zero volts because the capacitor, a capacitor resists changes in voltage. So it's the capacitor is going to begin to discharge, which doesn't allow this voltage at this pin to drop right away. Then when the switch is bouncing, it'll close again, the capacitor will charge some more. If it you know comes off contact again, the capacitor will discharge a tiny bit, but for the most part it'll keep the voltage where it is. And then finally the switch will settle, we'll have our high voltage. So the capacitor is the main thing sort of maintaining or preventing the switch bounce or the effects of the switch bounce. And once again, I mentioned that there's an important trade-off between the value of these resistors and the value of the capacitor. You know, we can pick a high value of resistance and a high value capacitor, and that'll ensure that no matter how long the switch bounces, it won't affect this interrupt pin because we have a lot of charge and it discharges slowly through these resistors because they're a high value, which is great if you have a switch that bounces a lot. But let's say you have a switch that you're turning on and off really quick. If you have a high value capacitance here and high value resistors, you may miss the switch turning on and off because it's taking so long for the capacitor to discharge. And I'm going to show an example of this. And the amount of time it takes the capacitor to charge and discharge is referred to as its RC time constant. And if you're interested in the math behind that, because you can really calculate this to an exact science based if you know how long the switch will bounce, I'm not going to go into that here. You can follow this link if you want more information on that. But it's important to note when you're tuning your circuit, you don't have to get into the math if you don't want to. When you're tuning your circuit, it depends on the resistance values and the value of the capacitor you choose. So let's look at an example. So here's the real anemometer. I have it connected to my debounce circuit that you just saw. And I'm gonna first start with a one microfarad capacitor and show you an example with that. And then I'm gonna add the 100 microfarad capacitor. The resistance values I keep the same, but you could vary these if you wanted to. Then I have an Arduino that I'm using to power this circuit. So VCC is connected to one pin of the anemometer. It then comes back out and feeds into the circuit. It's hard to see the diode here, but it's right here. So now let's look at this circuit in action. So first with the one microfarad cap. Here we can see we get a very similar output that we saw without the debounce circuit. So we see our pulses and they're spaced apart. And we use that to measure wind speed. If we zoom in though, just like we zoomed in without the debounce, we can see we don't have the drops to zero volts that we did before after the initial rise. So here, and, and you can't tell here, but the rise time is actually a little bit longer than it was with the last one because the capacitor is charging up. So the capacitor charges up and you can see that we do have the switch bouncing, but because of the capacitor holding that voltage level, it never goes to zero. So we can see here it tried to go to zero, here it tried to go to zero, and here it tried to go to zero, but the capacitor started to discharge to prevent it from dropping real quick. And what's important to note is, you know, to trigger the interrupt, I'm, I'm triggering the interrupt off a rising edge. Since, you know, we're not going below this threshold, we never re-trigger the interrupt. So that's important to note. So this solved my problem with the anemometer. I'm not triggering, I'm not getting false interrupts so I can actually measure the wind speed. And I will mention that I'm gonna do a video in the future that shows how to actually measure in software, how to measure the wind speed using an anemometer. But for now, I'm just talking about the debounce concept.
Now let's look at what happened if we would have used the 100 microfarad cap. Okay, here is a scope capture of the 100 microfarad cap. Notice the pulses are look much different because we have a large, we have a long charge time and we have a long discharge time. And that's because we have a higher value capacitor so it holds a larger charge. Now one thing I want to point out is if you notice zero volts is down here and because of the long discharge of the capacitor, the pulses never go all the way to zero volts before the next pulse. So for this example, this is not too much of an issue because you can see our charge time or our charge uh, edge is pretty constant. But let's say the anemometer is spinning really quick. What will happen is it never discharges far enough and you risk never discharging below the threshold of the digital pin so then all of a sudden you're not getting your interrupts. So it's important to note that this is the trade-off, the RC time constants, the resistance and capacitor values. You wanna tune them based on how often the switch is gonna open and close and how long the switch bounces because some switches bounce more than others. So for the anemometer, we don't wanna go for the high value because the anemometer spins a lot, really can spin real quick and a read relay doesn't have a lot of bounce. If we're using a manual switch that has a lot of bounce and we're not opening and closing real fast, we may want to use a higher resistance and higher capacitance value. Okay, that's it for eliminating switch bounce with a debounce circuit. If you have anything to add or any questions, use the comment section in the video. And if you like what you saw in this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.